So we're going to talk about sharks because they're. We're going to talk about sharks because they are the coolest things in the ocean. But first, I want to ask you: Did you come for me or did you come for beer? You don't have to lie. <laughs> That's a little bit more truthful. Hi. You guys sit down. Okay. So we're going to stay for science. Sounds good. So we're going to use a little word cloud, and I want to know what you all think about sharks. So type into the Mentimeter what one word is you think of when you hear the word shark. Sandpaper. Scary, Jaws, Expletive, Awesome, Fluid, Vicious, Teeth, Dope, Scary, Predator. All right, we've got a mix, we've got a mix. Okay. So, how many think that all sharks? Ooh. There you go. <laughs> well, the falses have it. All right. So, quoting Jaws here. When the shark gets a human, they become a rogue and develop a taste for human, not for a singular quest. They've got to be killed to be taken out. Our true is looking a little larger. That's, that's worrisome. All right. We're going to go with the falls. There is no evidence for a rogue shark. Sharks can sense electric fields produced by other living organisms. We have a lot of true. It is true. So they can actually have pits in their, their, uh, their snout, and so they can sense the electric fields given off by muscle movement of other organisms. And we had one person who said, no, I like it. They're always the top predator. You all know something. All right. So they are not the top predator always. They are a lot of the time, but Shamu is actually the one that can uh, put them into the dirt. The great white shark is preyed upon by other great white sharks and orcas. So the most dangerous thing in the ocean is Shamu. And what is the most likely time of day a shark is hunting. You guys know a lot already. I should just go sit down. So you are right. Dawn or dusk, those crepuscular or low light level hours. If a woman is menstruating, she will most assuredly be attacked. I get asked this on the phone at least once a week. So we've got kind of a mix here. That's interesting, understandably. There is no evidence, I repeat, no evidence to support that. None at all. I can't conclusively say that I know everything, but odds are that it's not a problem. They are not worried about human blood, it's fish blood. All right, now I'm actually gonna say things. So why do we have this primal fear? Why, why was Jaws so scary? Why? Why this mystery? 
So if you're walking along in a forest at night and you hear a noise, it's kind of spooky because you don't know what it is and your imagination takes over. It's a cougar or a bear or the boogeyman or whatever because you can't really you know, know for sure what's out there. And so the ocean is kind of like that all the time. We're not really meant to be in the ocean per se. So we can't really hear anything coming. We don't know what's, we can't really see it all the time. So we worry about what's below the waves. And so our imagination runs wild and we create monsters where there really aren't any. So my goal <coughs> me, is to shine a light on these guys to show you that sharks really aren't all that bad. And there are a lot of scarier things out there. So, <laughs> so sharks are fit. So unlike normal fish, sharks have cartilaginous skeletons. So they're much more flexible than a bony fish. Sharks are also an ancient lineage evolving almost 500 million years ago. My, my thoughts too. <laughs> and so over the course of evolution, the basic body form has stayed largely the same because it ain't broke, but the jaw has gone through some truly incredible transformations. And as all things do, including this, it is definitely extinct. <laughs> but many people would, would argue that. So one big misconception that I get a lot is that a shark is a shark. Sharks do blank, sharks do X. Well, no, some sharks do this and some sharks do that. They're all very diverse. You can't hear me at all. How's that? Better, all right. So sharks are very, very diverse and we make you know kind of assumptions that all sharks are the same. But what we're looking at here is some phylogenetic trees and kind of the relationship genetically. And so over here, we have a, a great white and a bull shark and a tiger shark. And so what I'm trying to illustrate here is that a great white is as related to a bull shark as a dog is to a kangaroo. <laughs> so when we say sharks do blank, there's a lot of room for error in that statement because no, they all do something different. So we're going to explore just how special and weird they are. So the first obvious thing is their teeth. So the teeth are basically specialized for each individual species diet. For example, this frill shark has very, very small barbed teeth meant for snaring fleshy fast prey like squid. But on the other hand, a nurse shark has these very short, blunt, uh, rounded teeth that are meant for crushing. So they can have hard prey such as lobsters or shellfish and they can crush them rather than snaring them. And so I think a lot of you already know that shark's teeth are basically on a conveyor belt. They don't have to worry about losing a tooth because they've got a whole bunch ready to take its place. And depending on the species, it can take anywhere from a week to a month before it's got that tooth already replaced. And you can look in the back after I'm done, I'll show you the jaws I have. Back in the gums, there's just rows and rows and rows and rows of teeth. So sharks have gills just like fish, but they're not protected by an operculum, that plate that a fish has, so they're much more sensitive. So that's why people always say, punch it in the snout or the gills. And the, the skin, they have teeth like skin, they have dentine, just like your teeth, on their scales. And so they've got these special little grooves in them that help them with their hydrodynamics so they can slip through the water really, really fast. And shum sharks can actually manipulate these microscopic scales in a way that turns them. And so they can actually make tighter turns by moving individual patches of scales better than like a fighter jet. So list the senses in order of use from nearest to farthest. So when a shark is zeroing in on a prey item, what do you think it does? What's, what's the first thing it senses? Thank 
we're just going to battle this out. They just keep flipping the two, the bottom and the top. They just keep going back and forth. All right, I think we about got it. So if you all think that it detects it with the electroreception first, then it smells it, then it hears it, then it sees it. Y'all is wrong. <laughs> so it hears its prey first. Yeah. And look where your electroreception is. It's the last thing it does. Yep. So far away, it can hear the low frequency sounds of fish that are struggling. It can zero in on that sound. Only then, once it's kind of picked up on it, does smell come into play. And so there's this myth that a shark can smell blood a mile away. And a lot of people think that, oh, I scraped my knee and there's a shark a mile away that just got excited. It doesn't work like that. It's got to, if blood diffused through the water for a mile, the shark could still detect it. And then it can detect pressure. So the movements in the water create little ripples or waves of energy. And the sharks have a, what's called a lateral line, like fish. And they have these little hair cells along their back and their spine where they can actually sense the vibrations in the movement. They can zero in even closer. And then that's when the vision takes in. And we're pretty close by now. We're, we're about 100 meters away, so 300-ish feet. And so once they're zeroed in, only in the very, very, very close proximity does the electroreception take over. And so a lot of times the shark will actually fold its eyes back into its head or have a special membrane to protect its eyes. So it's relying on that electroreception to guide it when it can't see. What's the difference between the and hearing? Between what? Pressure and hearing. Pressure and hearing? So the the... Hearing is, is an actual ear type mechanism, but the pressure is, it's actually sensing the vibrations in its body. And so it can zero in more particularly, basically it can kind of, it knows the direction, if you will, with the hearing, but the pressure it can, it's more dynamic and get kind of a size, a shape, it knows, so it's a little bit more sensitive, but similar mechanisms. So some sharks have, pretty cool abilities that others don't. For example, the mackerel sharks, like the salmon shark or great whites, they're actually warm blooded. Salmon sharks are the king of this because they can actually be 70 degrees warmer than the ambient water temperature. They live up in the Arctic and they eat chick chicken. No, they specialize on the salmon runs coming in. Some sharks, are world travelers. I mean, they go all over the place for seemingly no reason at all. Certain tiger sharks and great whites will swim between continents or move whole oceans just because they can. Um, and I'm sure there's a reason to this, but we don't have an answer right now. Sharks are very diverse. Some lay eggs and some have live birth. And so it just depends on the species. And even within genuses, this varies. And we've got to pause for the coolest eggs in, of all the sharks. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's very cute. It's, it's got to be the cutest shark, baby. This is the horn shark. And so it's a corkscrew egg. So the mom lays the egg, picks it up in her mouth, and then screws it into a rock crevice to keep the baby safe. Because these uh, actually other sharks and certain mollusks will come and try and eat the baby embryo. But if they make it, they come out real cute. Some sharks can clone. They can reproduce asexually. <laughs> And we found this out just like Jurassic Park. We had a captive population of these bonnethead sharks. They, a couple years went by and life found a way. <laughs> Next thing you know, there was a pregnancy and they're like, well, there's no men. <laughs> so they did some genetics and they realized it's because baby and mom are the same. So I think I've kind of driven home the point that all because it's a shark it doesn't really mean that it's means the same, so we can't really treat them all the same. Because we've got a very diverse group. We've got fast sharks like this 
short fin mako, which can go as fast as a speedboat. We've got sharks that barely move. They're ambush predators like this wobegong. We've got giant sharks that are bigger than 40 feet like this filter feeding whale shark. It's a relative of the nurse shark you guys see around Florida. We've got tiny sharks like this dwarf lantern shark of the deep sea. We've got ugly sharks like this goblin shark. <laughs> We've got really shy sharks, like this graph shark. <laughs> we have actual shy sharks. <laughs> and then we have this guy who was actually discovered this year. This is the pocket shark. And so it has a special ability that it has pockets in its armpits. <laughs> and it can shoot bioluminescent goo out of them. And so to put yourself in the shoes of the pocket shark, imagine there was a bully. And your first instinct was to shoot bioluminescent goo out of your armpits. Well, that bully, that bully would probably be pretty freaked out or not want to catch what you had or or even would try to attack the goo. So it's a pretty good defense mechanism. And we gotta talk about sharks and rays, or, or sharks and rays, they're just flat sharks. They're literally just flat sharks. <laughs> and we have to mention that today is International Sawfish Day. So there's five species of sawfish in the world that are still alive. Three are critically endangered, two are endangered. We try our best to monitor the populations using citizen science. And we're honestly seeing locally that our species here in Florida, the small tooth sawfish, is making a comeback. So <laughs> happy International Sawfish Day. And you can come get some swag from me in the back after we're done. So let's talk about the sharks that we have in Florida. And what, what is our kind of risk index? So first off, we've got our black tips and our spinners. These are, you're not gonna die from a black tip or a spinner, but they account for a ton of bites. So they're in the surf zone, they're catching bait fish, it's kind of murky, and they see a flash of movement and they re react with good hunting skills. Problem is, it's probably a surfer's foot. And the surfer's bigger than them, so they let go. And a lot of these guys, they just don't care. They just keep surfing. <laughs> it's pretty minor. Oh, how did we get here? All right. All right, we're back on track. So, Gail, but honestly, you can dive with these guys safely. You just want to give them their space. You want to treat them with a little bit of respect but they're not too dangerous. And then we get to the ones that are actually, you know, you want to give them some space. We have the bull shark, which is highly aggressive and territorial. It's not out to eat you, but it doesn't want you in its space. And then we've got the tiger shark, which is so big, it just has random days it decides to, to bite stuff because it doesn't have thumbs to touch it. <laughs> and they're almost 20 feet long, so when they bite you, it's not good. <laughs> and the last one, you, as long as you have a brain, you don't have to worry about, but some people <laughs> are nurse sharks. Now, nurse sharks are very calm, very docile, and people think, therefore, they can hug them and squeeze them and do whatever they want to them. Go home and do that to your dog or cat and see what happens. <laughs> for like an hour. <laughs> so that kind of brings us into what we do at the museum, what I personally do. I'm the manager of the International Shark Tech file, as, long as, the whole, as well as the whole program. So what we do is we are the only scientifically verified database and investigatory service of shark attack. So whenever there's a shark attack in the world, we're the guys who are investigating it. 
And so the file was actually created by the Navy in the late 50s. They were concerned about the next war being on the water. Opposite that never happened. Um, and they wanted to prevent shark attacks on down ships. And since no naval battles were really occurring, funding dried up and they gave it over to the Smithsonian. It changed hands for a couple of years and nobody really did much with it, but it eventually wound up here in the late 80s. Today, it has blossomed into the world leader and most trusted resource for shark attacks with over 6,400 cases. Yeah. Well, I don't know. That's, you know. <laughs> that's frowned upon. <laughs> but we get excited too. <laughs> so what happens when there's a shark bite? Normally we hear about it first on either through a contact or through the news, because they're the first on it. So once we've uh, you know, identified its existence, then we start looking. We go out and we find the person involved or the victims. We get statements from whoever we can. And then we try really hard to figure out what the circumstances involved were. And then ideally, we'd get photographs, whether it be uh, the victim sends it to us or an autopsy report or et cetera. Hopefully we can identify the bite to the species. Using all of this information, we try to identify who is at fault because people are stupid. <laughs> so we don't want to say that shark attacks just happen all the time when people are out there hugging them. And so the ones that are actually legitimate that we call unprovoked are, you know, very informative. And we're working and we're getting better at this and we're kind of learning with the database is, is big enough now that we're, we're starting to see some slight trends, but we need more actual testing experimentation to tease it apart. But we use what we know to advise beach safety. So people all over the world, we can tailor it to their species. Because remember, all those species are very different. And so we can say that, you know, this is what you should do for your area. So let's talk about stupid people. <laughs> I can't tell you the specifics of some real fun cases because of HIPAA. So I can give you some general stuff. <laughs> but I'm getting real fun. <laughs> so the number one that I get all the time is, is spear fishermen who they kill a fish, there's blood in the water, it's thrashing around, a shark comes in and they're like, I'm gonna kill this shark. You gonna lose. <laughs> they always lose. <laughs> Give the shark a fish and get out of water. <laughs> Then we get people fishing for sharks. They are actively looking for sharks, but they don't know what they're going to do once they get one. <laughs> and things go poorly. And then we have our huggers, the tourists, who are like, oh, I've, I've changed my life. I'm going to hug you and just thank God that you exist. And wow. And then it's terrible. And we, we hear these sob stories about the savage, brutal attack. And then you see the video. <laughs> and the last one, we see a lot of these baited tourist dives. So they, they get the tourists down, they put a bunch of bait in the water, there's dead fish everywhere, the sharks are frenzying, and, you know, grandma gets in the way. And I'm sorry, but I don't want to swim in chum. <laughs> so what do we actually learn from the, the real data, the unprovoked bites? So last year we had 66 confirmed unprovoked bites. We had five fatalities, four of which were unprovoked and one of which was preventable, sadly. Um, we have an average over the past five years, about six fatalities and 84 confirmed. And so what we're kind of seeing in these trends is that these aren't predatory actions. They're test bites because sharks don't have hands. Not that that really helps with the you know, whole hole issue, but they're like, ooh, what is that? And then they, they take a little novel. And when a 20 foot animal novels, it can be painful. <laughs> and so a lot of times where we see these fatalities is because it, it bites them in the thigh, so it gets the artery. It's not a bad bite, it's just a deep bite. If it bit anywhere else, they'd be fine. And so that's very unfortunate. 
And so what we're seeing in the, the long term, if we look across decades, is that shark attacks are on the rise, but so is population. So that kind of makes sense. But if we look at the short term, shark attacks are on the decrease. And we like to attribute this to better safety procedures. And so far, 2019, though I'm not allowed to discuss the numbers, we're on track for an even lower year. Yeah, so we've got to hold out for two and a half months. It's Australia's turn now. They've got to, you know, keep us going. So one more polling question. How would you rank the following in likelihood? Shark attack, killed by a dog, killed in a boating accident, bitten by a person, struck by lightning, or killed by sand? Oh, oh, we won't we will not know until the wheel starts turning. Killed in a boating accident, bitten by a person, killed by a dog, struck by lightning, killed by a sand, shark attack. Y'all are close. All right, I think you've about got it. So the final vote is bitten by a person is the most likely, then killed in a boating accident. Killed by a dog, struck by lightning, killed by sand, and then lastly, shark attack. So what are the actual odds? How likely is it? So as of right now, it's one in 11 and a half million to be bitten. To actually die, it's like less than one, it's like 0.8 or something, uh, in 264.1 million, it ain't gonna happen. What is going to happen is that you are two and a half more likely to be killed in a sand-related incident. <laughs> these kids dig these holes on the beach and then the joggers go out in the morning and break their neck. <laughs> but if we say it's the children's fault, they get mad to the sand. <laughs> you are 33 times more likely to be killed by a dog but we don't want to put that in the news because dogs are our friends. <laughs> you are 76 times more likely to be struck by a lightning. You are 250 times more likely to be bitten by another human being. Look left, look right, and grab your mace. <laughs> In the state of Florida, not the globe, Florida, home, here, over 400 times more likely to die on a boat. To be fair, that's a lot of spring breakers, but still. So we know the odds are crazy ridiculous, but let's try and lower them just to Tiny little bit. So it's always a good idea to swim with a buddy because there's safety in numbers. Sharks aren't as attractive. If something does happen, you got somebody right there. Don't swim at dawn or dusk. We already talked about that. That's when they're most active in their hunting because the sun is low and they're using that low light at their back to mask their approach on the fish. Avoid swimming near bait or where people are fishing because if they're trying to catch sharks or shark food, I wouldn't want to swim in that. No jewelry. So the shimmer of the jewelry can be like that of a fish scale. So it could attract sharks accidentally. And prolonged periods of splashing, because splashing actually feels or sounds like uh, a struggling fish. It's that same low frequency sound. So if you and your friend are splashing each other back and forth, you sound like a dying fish. <laughs> So Florida just got some new laws this July <clears throat> with 
the aim of helping to save some more at-risk species. And I didn't say this, but frankly, people. <laughs> so now you have to take a shark fishing class so you know what to do when you get it on land. And if it is a prohibited species, you can no longer take it out of water and you have to cut the line or the hook, whatever's easiest, whatever's fastest. And a lot of people get upset and they're like, well, it's swimming around with a hook in its mouth. It ain't going to bother. You're going to do far more harm if this is a, you know, valuable species than just leave the hook in. And the problem is that when you, you know, reel these animals in, they go through all this effort and, and trauma and take them out on land, they get very stressed. So if you don't intend to harvest this animal, it's probably going to die anyway. Because when you work out and you feel that burn, that lactic acid, the really anaerobic um, part of your muscles, well, the sharks have that same bit, but they don't have a cutoff switch. So it just builds and builds and builds. So the stress and the lactic acid can literally kill them. So we want to minimize that stress as soon as possible. So cut that line. So should we be even catching sharks at all? So the fin trade has put a major, major hurting on many, many species. And there's other industries which, you know, long lining, which have a ton of bycatch. species. Blue sharks, for example, are hit very, very hard. Sharks are, the majority of sharks are, are very slow to reproduce. Some species don't become reproductively active until they're 20. I mean, there's estimates that the Greenland shark, and we don't know this, but there are estimates that it doesn't even become reproductively active until it's 100. Right, so it takes a long time. So if you take out a bunch from the population, they're not gonna bounce back so quick. As apex predators, they also have high levels of mercury. So the toxins build up through the different levels of the food chain since they're at the top, except always. Then, you consume that, and that's not good for you. So my answer is yes, but only certain ones. So these large pelagic species have been hurt really, really bad. And some of them are recovering, some of them are not. The white sharks are making a pretty good recovery in the Atlantic, thanks to a lot of, you know, really dedicated people. And now the people on Cape Cod are having to, to deal with the repercussions of a healthy white shark population. But it's actually really important that we, we don't just ban fishing for sharks outright. So the Dingle Johnson Act and Pittman Robinson, they said, these counterpart for hunting, all of the funds for equipment and licenses, et cetera, actually go into an account for the government, which accounts for anywhere between 80 to 90% of the total government funding of conservation for the country. So hunters and fishermen are actually what keep us going. And in many cases, there are some states that are entirely funded by those sales. And in addition to just the money, these are the people who are out there actively, you know, gaining the knowledge. They're the first, hand, they're the first people we go to. They have a value in the resource. They're invested in it. They want to be out there. They, they're excited about it. And many of these smaller coastal sharks, they're perfectly fine to eat. They have good numbers and they're safe. Um, and it's just, we want to see people enjoy the resource because it's hard to save something when you, you can't put a value on it, if you will. People who are out there and excited about it and see them every day and want to do Good. I mean, the hunters and fishermen, I cannot sing their praises enough. They do the time. So if you want to learn more about sharks, you can go to some local aquariums, or you can use that QR code to check out our website. But I thank you all very much. I'll be happy to answer questions. <laughs> I'll wait for Mendy Major, but you had a question. Yes, could you put anything to compare electromagnetic signs? So the question was, can you confuse their electromagnetic senses? This is a highly debated and researched question. And the fact is we don't know. 
because some people say yes, some people say no. And people have even started marketing devices that will quote unquote protect you. Those don't have 100% success rates on the species they're even tested on. And remember, they're only tested on like about two or three species each. And there's, you know, a dozen or more you got to worry about. I can't hear you. Oh, thanks. She wanted to know if there was multiple embryos in an egg case. Nope, just one like a chicken egg. So you might get lucky and find a double yolk, which normally don't see twins. All right. <laughs> How many shark types do you own? I own four. <laughs> do they sleep with their eyes open? Sharks have a, a rest state, and they do technically keep their eyes open. It's, it's not sleep as we know it. What's the male to female population split for sharks? Well, I know that that is very hard because some species will actually um, split up until it's the mating season. So the females will go one way and the males will go another, and then they'll join up. And so it's really hard to get estimates. Now, it's a safe bet that it's 50-50, but the honest answer is we don't know and we can't really find out right now. Can you explain why the great white shark at those eight, all those people in Manhattan Creek? Well, first of all, it was a tiger shark. Um, and it was multiple tigers. We don't know. It wasn't just one single individual. We don't know why they were attracted in that area, but there was a lot of bathers. We don't know all the details involved, but it was probably just the tigers were curious. They killed a single shark and they ruled it over. And they just lucked out and there were no more bites. Is it true if sharks, if sharks stop swimming, they will die? Depends on the species. Some sharks are what we call ram ventilators. So that means they have to force water over their gills. And so that's why when you catch a shark and you're trying to release it, you gotta keep it in the surf so you got water flowing over the gills. So that is important or else they'll suffocate. Other sharks can do what we call bugle pumping, where they can move the muscles of their neck and they can actively pump water by themselves. So like a nurse shark can do this. So they can sit on the bottom and just sort of chill out. What is your favorite shark? My favorite shark changes weekly, but <laughs> I normally gravitate back to tiger sharks just because they're always the exception to the rule. When everyone, someone says like, you know, like you think they're doing this, then the tigers just throw a monkey wrench and it's like, yeah, we really don't care about rules. We'll do whatever. <laughs> and I think that's kind of cool. Do nurse sharks work in hospitals? No. <laughs> <laughs> Could the Meg be real, living deep down the bottom of the ocean? So if you're referring to the movie plot, it was a fun action movie. It was a really bad science movie. So Megalodon's diet would not be, you know, compatible with that deep ocean environment. They were living off of blubbery whales. There's nothing down there to sustain an animal of that size. Um, the big sharks we see at the bottom of the ocean are scavengers. And I mean, the whale falls, they're, I mean, they're pretty consumed by the time they get down there. There's just not enough dependable resources for an animal that big. And the whole issue of a, a thermocline layer, for, you know, protecting them is, it just, it, is, it wouldn't work. So no, there is no Meg. We're losing some. Um, I don't know if humans smell rain more accurately than sharks. I've never, <laughs> I've never heard of them. Sorry. Um, why aren't there freshwater sharks? There are freshwater sharks. <laughs> um, there are a good number of freshwater sharks. Um, and the bull shark and lemon sharks can be both. They can switch between the two. 
And we have many uh, river or jungle sharks found in South America and Australia. And one really cool one that's really rare is the Glimpus shark. So go ahead and give that a Google. It was on uh, an episode of River Monsters. That was really fun. Um, what can people do to help conservation? Buy a fishing license. That that's money right there. But if you want to just everyday stuff, it's just you know be aware of things, be conscious about your recycling and your impact on the earth, and it's just small stuff. I mean, uh, just if you hear somebody saying something that isn't true, just say, hey, you want might want to check out this resource. Don't need to challenge them. Just point them in the right direction for some education. Yes, I come to science on tap. Uh, do shark attack probabilities include everyone or only those in the water? Uh, that would be only everyone in the water. So we try to base that off of bathers, though there are estimates when we're just looking at people at the beach. Um, we are currently doing a study at New Smyrna Beach, the shark bite capital of the world, and we're using drone footage to count the number of people actively in the water at any given time. So we can actually use the, the true statistics. We know how many people are there and how many sharks are there. Yes. Are ocean plastics an issue for sharks? Absolutely. Are ocean plastics an issue for sharks? They, ocean plastics are an issue for everything. And the shark might not be filter feeding. Some whale sharks certainly, but like say a great white, is that gonna be affected by ocean plastics? Well, their food's full of it, so therefore, they're going to be full of it. So yes, it is absolutely an issue. Um, do humans affect shark migration patterns? The official answer is we don't know. My unofficial answer is pretty sure. We're actually seeing a significant drop in the black tip migration off the coast of Florida this year because Last year was a, one of the warmest ocean temperature years in a long time, and we saw a big dip in the population or, that was moving south. Now this year, it's even warmer, and it still hasn't come. It's supposed to have, they should have arrived a month ago, and we're still waiting. So yes, I absolutely believe that humans are affecting migration patterns, but we need more data to back that up. Do you think Florida will follow what Massachusetts has done with providing shark attack kits on beaches in cases of emergency? So there are some places in Florida that these stop the bleed kits. So they have tourniquets and whatever else they need for emergency services to keep for people to hang on until a helicopter or whatever could get there. There are some beaches in Florida that already have this, but it seems that Florida overall is just sort of like, eh. Um, we've had the sharks for a while. Massachusetts is just getting used to it. So Florida isn't really worried about it. Are whale sharks different from other sharks? Yes. I mean, so whale sharks are filter feeders. They've, they've got very beautiful patterns. They're the largest fish in all of the, not just sharks, so actual bony fish. So yeah, they're pretty different. How are we doing on time? One more question. One more question. Do we have a favorite? <laughs> what's the what's the dumbest shark? I don't I don't think there's a dumb shark. Sharks are actually super intelligent. They've actually hmm? Pool shark, yeah, yeah. Pool sharks the dumbest. But there's actually been some experiments that um, showed that sharks can can learn behaviors and even um, do can even have extreme memory. So there were some experiments a while back where the sharks, just like a chip, would know what shape to push to match in order to get food. And so they would actually could feed themselves at any time. The shape would change. They could match it find it on the wall, punch it with their nose, get food. Sharks are highly intelligent. Thank you very much. I'll be in the back to answer more questions.
lady in the back that would like to get some data from you guys. So if you don't mind.